All right, very good. Yep, it's coming up. It's all good. Very That's good. Fair. So I'm Chuck Derry, Gender Violence Institute in Minnesota, North Central U.S. And um, I'm going to be talking primarily about how do we reshape environments um, and change the outcomes. So how do we attend to the environments that are causing so many men to be sexually abusive and, and uh, physically abusive towards women and harassing women and, and creating this world of... Uh, threat and fear for women and and uh, limited opportunities compared to men. So we'll be talking about that. And so I think the Me Too um, is an excellent, uh, has really been an excellent cultural phenomenon to me. It's like I've been doing this work since uh, for 35 years, since 1983. And this is the first time that I've seen some distinct consequences. So talking about intervention and primary prevention. So intervention is responding after the harm has occurred. Um, this is the first time I've seen distinct uh, consequences for men um, at this level of influence and power throughout the United States being called out. And then people actually listening to the women, not and actually caring about what happened to them and not blaming them, but actually holding the men accountable. So this is an important part of our work as we work together with women in partnership to hold men accountable, ourselves and others accountable. And so this is intervention pieces. My main focus is gonna be primary prevention, but I wanna note this as well, because the intervention and primary prevention together is what is gonna change these social norms. But these are three um, protocols that are comprehensive protocols. Blueprint for Safety is a comprehensive protocol for criminal justice uh, collaborative responses to domestic violence. Uh, the sexual assault response team is a connection again for sexual violence and the collaborations between criminal justice and advocacy, victim services programs and the health community. And then the Better Women's Justice Project has SAFER, which is a new protocol they designed for child protection and custody evaluation uh, where uh, domestic violence is uh, involved. But again, this is where I'm gonna focus. Primary prevention. So how do we stop this before it starts, right? How do we reshape the environment that creates this much violence towards women and girls and children and boys, right? What are the norms that support these actions? What are the things that we just take for granted we don't even think about? Uh, a lot of this behavior is invisible right in front of our eyes and much of it isn't either as well. And one of the things that happened for me is in about 2005, I co-founded the Minnesota Men's Action Network, Alliance to Prevent Sexual and Domestic Violence. And about that same time, the Prevention Institute came out with the spectrum of, of prevention. Some of you may be familiar with it, but the image that they came out with was stacked as bars. And I was working with Native American colleagues and they said, this, this graphic doesn't quite work for us. And so they restructured it into this graphic, in a circular encompassing graphic, which I really like. And the thing about this that I really appreciate and really made an impact on our work with men uh, was looking at what is the most impactful if we want to change social norms. So this is a public policy, or excuse me, this is a public health um, initiative. And a lot of times when people are thinking about prevention, they're thinking about education and awareness. But you'll see that the smallest circle, the smallest impact is strengthening individual knowledge and skills. If you want to change social cultural structures of oppression. And we know this historically through many, many different kinds. I mean, Mar Magali brought up last uh, website about uh, socio-ecological model, which this is, this is fashioned after, and talked about smoking. You know, we had, for years, we had education about smoking and how it causes cancer, and we kept smoking. It's kind of nice, right? And then some organizational practices started changing. We had workplace where we couldn't smoke in the workplace anymore. And then in Minnesota, they created public policy, a state law that we could not smoke in public places. So it dealt, it radically changed the atmosphere in Minnesota around smoking and the secondhand smoke. I wasn't impacted then by secondhand smoke of others, right? So the, when we are engaging men and working with communities, uh, the only reason that we would ever do awareness or educational trainings and workshops and presentations is to create the social capital and the political will to move to changing organizational practices and public policies. And this totally changed how we thought about our work. Had significant, significant impact. And so a lot of what we're doing is doing focus groups and, 
meeting with men and trying to develop uh, men's groups. And we could get men together all over the state. Not a problem. The problem was we didn't know what to do with them once we got them together. So once they had this education, then what's the next step? How do we how do we level this up? So part of what we did is cre started creating initiatives, and I'll share those with you, so that we could give those to men and say, here, go do this, go do that. And they're all available on uh, our website, downloadable and replicable. So the key point here is that these are primary prevention initiatives. So they focus less on individual behaviors and more on changing the environments that shape those individual behaviors, okay? So one of the first things we did was the clean hotel, Minnesota clean hotels policy. And my colleague who was working at the Minnesota uh, Department of Health in the sexual violence prevention unit, and she was at a, so this is mid 2000, this is probably 2006 or so, but she was at a con state conference in uh, Brainerd, Minnesota, uh, that the Office of Justice Programs, the Minnesota State Office of Justice Programs put on. They have a yearly conference. It's a crime victims conference. You get 350, 500 people there. So it's a nice crowd. She spent the whole day uh, in workshops, presentations about sexual violence prevention and attending to sexual violence uh, victims appropriately. After a long day of sitting in trainings, she went up to her room chill out, turn on the TV, and there was porn. So adult pay-per-view pornography was on the TV at this, at this resort conference center. And she's going, wow, okay, I just spent the whole day talking about sexual violence, and now I go up to my room, I don't even leave the building, and I go up to my room and here's porn. And when I talk about porn, this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, sexually explicit material in general, I'm talking about this type the type that objectifies and exploits its subjects, predominantly women and children, while eroticizing domination, degradation, and violence. And there was a great uh, study in Boston in 2007 that identified, took the top grossing pornographic films and, 90, and looked at, coded all the behaviors that was happening in pornography. 90% of the behaviors were physically or, or uh, emotionally, uh, verbally aggressive, right? 3,376 different acts of verbal and physical abuse in porn. And so this is why we thought, okay, I, I spend all day talking about sexual violence and then I go up to my room and hear sexual violence is on the TV for what, my entertainment? What do we do about this? So we created the Clean Hotels Initiative and this is predominantly, it's a model policy. And what it is, it's a travel policy and a meeting and conference center uh, policy as well. So in this policy, uh, for organizations, businesses, uh, any type of uh, organization, of course, that you will only reimburse your employees when they travel and they have to stay overnight. You'll only reimburse them if they stay in a hotel that do not offer pay-per-view pornography in their sleeping rooms. And also you have a policy that your organization, whether it's your campus, your church, your, your uh, uh, county, your state, will not um, set up meetings and conferences in facilities that sell adult pay-per-view pornography as well. And basically what this is, a, this is a small divestiture policy. This is these organizations and these businesses and these communities saying, I will no longer support and give my money to businesses who are profiting off of women's pain and exploitation, won't do it. And so I'll give you an example how this worked. So this is about getting to the revenue stream. We didn't like uh, go around every hotel in Minnesota and try to convince them to pull the porn because of its impact, right? We went to the revenue stream. And a good example of that is that the county in Southeast Minnesota, Winona County adopted this. We worked with them to adopt this uh, ordinance so that all county employees, if they stay overnight in any hotels, it has to be a hotel that does not sell adult pay-per-view pornography. So there was a large, statewide conference for law enforcement in Minnesota, in St. Paul, St. Paul Holiday Inn East. St. Paul is, a, is the capital of Minnesota. And big conference, and the chief deputy of the Winona County Sheriff's Department contacted them and asked them, do you sell adult pornography? Do you sell pornography in your sleeping rooms? And the woman he was talking to said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm sorry, then my officers, I, myself and my officers can't, can't attend. Uh, we can't stay overnight. We'll come to the conference. It's a two or three day conference. We can come to the conference, but we can't stay overnight in your hotel. She said, why? 
he said, well, it's because of pornography and it's not the sex, it's the violence. So he's making, tying the, the sexual violence that was tied to pornography and the impact on the culture. And she said, oh, wow, okay. Um, how long before you have to make a decision about where you, can, you, you and your, your officers can stay? He said, oh, about 10 days. And within five days, he got this email from her. Please rest assured that we've always had the ability to shut off the adult options in guest rooms, but we have actually taken it a step further to improve our government business. Bang. This was the whole point of this policy, is getting to the revenue stream and letting them know that they will not make any more money from us. We won't participate in them profiting off of women's pain. And so it's very nice to see this email and it worked, they pulled the porn. Simply because one officer called and said, we won't come and they pulled it just like that. And this is downloadable. The Winona County policies and protocols are downloadable um, from the website, uh, Gender Violence Institute website as well. So the next thing we did was we thought, okay, what if we're gonna do primary prevention, we wanna shape the social norms and the social environment that supports violence against women and sexual harassment and degradation. What's a sector that we should focus on? What's a sector that has impact? And we came to this, right? We came to sports and we started focusing on sports and we spoke focusing on coaches. And what we know is that in research has shown, and you talk to adults who grew up in sports, they'll say the second most influential adult in their life was their coach. You know, second from their mom and their dad, right? Or their other caregiver, whoever it was, but they had amazing potential. So we decided to do a training, an online training called Coaching for Change. And it's about uh, gender equity and respect. How you create a team culture of gender equity and respect. And one of the things we, one of the first things we did was that we connected with the Minnesota State High School League. Because we're thinking, how do we institutionalize the goals and objectives of this training, right? Using the spectrum of prevention again as a guide in our work. And so we thought, okay, let's talk to the Minnesota State High School League because they certify all coaches in Minnesota. You can't coach in a high school in Minnesota unless you have certification from Minnesota State High School League. So we thought, okay, let's start from the beginning with them and see how we can create this training in a way that they will accept for all coaches in Minnesota. And that was a key thing with them for us is this has to be for all coaches, all sports, boys and girls sports, et cetera, et cetera, which we did. And basically it gets into the, what are the social norms? What are the culture norms that support um, sexist oppression? What's courageous conversations that coaches can have? What are red flags if you see some of your youth that may be experiencing violence at home or in their relationships? And what are resources? And so, so just to give you an example, some of the stuff that we did, you know, so this is a 16-year-old, 17-year-old's bedroom, a boy's bedroom. So what's on his wall? When he wakes up in the morning, what's the radio, you know, to his radio alarm? What's the music? What are the lyrics coming out? You know, when he looks down and grabs a magazine off the floor, is it Sports Illustrated, Swimsuit Edition? You know, what are all the, when he pulls on his jeans, just pull on his jeans to go to the bathroom. Uh, what's the advertisement that's tied to those jeans? And what are the messages that he's getting? So we're just, again, teaching coaches to look and to see all these cultural norms that we've taken for granted that shape men's and boys' behaviors. Same thing with girls. What's, what, just even when they get up in the morning, what are they surrounded with? We're not even talking, they haven't even left their bedroom yet, right? What are they surrounded with? What are the messages they get about what it means to be a girl? And then we set them up with interactive kinds of trainings about when they have these, these courageous conversations, when they see these moments. So there's an example of two guys, you know, one guy took a picture of his girlfriend without her knowing it, right? And she's semi-naked and he's showing it to his friends and his friends saying, oh my God, man, you gotta, you gotta send that to James, holy macro, right? So coach walks by and he hears this stuff, what does he do? So we have different ways in which we, they can uh, respond to what they should do. And then we have videos of coaches who actually express what they would do under that circumstances. And there's several kinds of scenarios like this. And it's the same thing for the girls, right? Because this is for coaching boys and girls. So she's being pressured to send provocative photos to her boyfriend, right? And then he gets those, and man, his friends are all over him in the locker room saying, man, you gotta get that over to you know, Ricky, man, holy, right? And so anyway, we, we give coaches examples of how they can have these conversations when this comes up and how to see it. So it's not invisible right in front of their eyes. We also talk about how do you 
in general create a team culture, you know, of, of respect for women and girls. Um, the Minnesota State High School League did, we didn't know they were going to do this in the beginning. We took a risk, but in the end, they did actually mandate this training for all Minnesota State High School coaches. So 25,000 coaches, for them to get their certificate in Minnesota, they have to take this training on gender equity and respect. And we also did a parallel uh, program on uh, community athletics. So the high school version is, is geared towards 14 to 18 year olds. The community athletics is geared to more middle school, 11 to 14 year olds. And again, this is online and it's available free. And so this could be replicated in any state or province. In, in the US, any state could replicate what the Minnesota State High School League did, and they would help them do that. The next thing we did was we looked at, um, we looked at uh, campuses. And where's the most dangerous place for campuses? On, on campus, and that's parties, right? So created the best party model. Be equal, safe, and trustworthy. So what's the environment in, within that party that will impact whether it is safe or not for women. And we talked to uh, college age women and asked them, when you walk into a party, what do you look for? And they said, this is what I look for in their environment to see whether it's safe. And so then we created this best party model related to that. Now businesses know how to do this all the time. They know how to set up environments. Like if I'm in a coffee shop, how do people act? Right, you're sipping coffee, you're having a little conversation, maybe you're on your computer, you're on your phone, whatever, right? It's very quiet, right? What about sports bars? How do they set up that environment? Well, you're screaming, you're yelling, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if you act in a coffee shop like you do in a sports bar, what'll happen? You'll be asked to leave. And, you know, if you're in a sports bar and you act like you do in a coffee shop, your friends will look at you and say, what the Chuck, what are you doing, man? They just scored a goal, what are you, how come you're so quiet? So again, it's about reshaping these environments so that you can have wild parties. And this isn't about abstinence because if you have abstinence, no one's come to the party, right? How do you have a wild party and eliminate the possibilities and threats of sexual violence? And this, is, and this has opened so many doors, it's been amazing when we're on campuses. I apologize for the ringing. When we're on campuses, um, this opened doors for, you know, if you go on campus and you talk about sexual violence, people go, oh, you know, it's kind of a, it's not a very fun conversation. But if you talk about parties, they go, whoa, parties, yeah, okay, fine, yeah. This opened doors in residential halls, athletics, frat houses, all kinds of places to really look at primary prevention and shaping the norms. Lastly, we created the Mending Project. And this was really designed, um, this is responding after the harm has occurred. And this was really designed because I was a little frustrated going to events. All I had to do is, and this is true for all guys, all I had to do is show up at a Take Back the Night event, a Walk a Mile in Her Shoes event, a luncheon around sexual and domestic violence once or twice a year, and I was a hero. I get all kinds of pats, oh, we're glad, so glad to see you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because so few men were showing up. So the bar about my expectations was about four inches off the ground to be a good guy. That's all I had to do is show up. And we were talking about how do we raise this bar? And so then we created the Mending Project. Again, this is downloadable from our site, all, all the documents you need. And this is a pro bono goods and services initiative that men in the community will work with local advocacy, uh, victim services organizations to solicit businesses to provide free and reduced cost goods and services for victims of sexual and domestic violence, including sex trafficking and prostitution. And so for women uh, caught in prostitution and domestic violence, one of the big things are housing safe housing. So these men go off to the landlord and said, will you waive the uh, damage deposit and give them 25, 50% off the rent for the first six months? Or you go down to the tire shop because every time women try to get away, the guys are slashing their tires. Will you give a free set of tires and maybe two half price set of tires each quarter for victims? Or you go to the chiropractor because he slammed her over her knee, right? Or you go to the attorney because they're going through all kinds of custody stuff. And so there's 60 different businesses on our website identified that men um, as a community go to and solicit these um, free and reduced cost goods and services for victims. So it's a way that men are taking collective responsibility for the harm that men have done, right? And they do this in, in partnership with women. And you can do a great mentoring project. So you could do, you have the college, uh, young college men uh, work with the high school boys and go around and talk to these businesses. And it changes the, the conversation. Um, the one thing about the, the I mentioned uh, the clean hotels thing is that totally changed the conversation when you do 
policy, it also impacts education. They change all the water cooler talks throughout Winona when we did the clean hotels thing on porn. All the discussions around porn changed. It went about, it was about sexual violence. It wasn't about the sex, it was about the violence. And the same thing with Mending Project. What happens is you start having a, you go into the tire shop and there's a little uh, countertop display that says the Mending Project. Men taking responsibility for the harm that men have done. And you start to shift the culture and you have signs on businesses that say they're a Mending Project business. And people start going to that business. So money talks, right? And so I think these are just some really uh, simple initiatives and examples of, of initiatives of engaging men. And they come to the room and then now what do we want them to do? Because sexual and domestic violence is gonna stop, men are gonna have to stop it, right? And we work in always in partnership with women, always in partnership with women. And this is on us, really, this is on us. It's all in there. Thanks so much, Chuck. That was great. Definitely seen some comments popping up over on the chat box about how much folks are appreciating it. If anyone has a question for Chuck, now is the great time to either raise your hand or type it into the chat box um, to ask. So we'll just give a couple seconds here and see if anyone wants to jump in. And again, most of these, three of these initiatives are on our uh, Gender Violence Institute website and the, the best party models on the Menace Peacemakers website. Thanks, Chuck. So I'll stop my share yeah. and pass it back to you, Toby. Great, sounds good. And while we're waiting for anyone else, could I ask, are y'all, for just that last piece, the Mending Project, which sounds super exciting, um, have you or are you thinking about a way to tie in the current Me Too climate with some of the pitches. I don't know what's on the website there, if you have sample pitches for businesses that's gonna call into this new energy around Me Too and being aware of and accountable to, to the problem. Or have you seen any uptick in businesses being willing to, to sign on because of what's happening with Me Too? That was for you, Chuck. You're on mute. <laughs> yes, I am. I, I'm sorry, say that again. Toby. Just curious if you've seen either an uptick in businesses being willing to sign into the mending projects thanks to the efforts of Me Too, or if you're thinking about some way to like craft language around talking about Me Too in a way that's not co-opting it, but is using that energy to get more people involved. I think it, it's a fairly uh, new initiative. Uh -huh. And um, there's actually a group in, in near me, in town of about 120,000. Uh, men who are just going to be gathering here in a couple of weeks to begin this initiative in that town. But I think the Me Too is an excellent opportunity. I think speaking to that, and it has gotten the attention of men. And so now how do we direct that attention? And how do we do that in partnership and support for women? So I think it's a very good time for businesses um, and an excellent time for bringing this kind of mending project into the communities. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so I don't see anyone's hand up. I didn't see any questions in the chat box for now. So we'll have some more time at the end if you're still thinking of what to ask. And Russ CB, is making a motion. There is one. Somebody's got their hand I didn't up. Know how to, I didn't know how to, I was trying to find where to raise my hand. You are right, sorry. Um, but I, I did have a couple of just real quick questions on, um, uh, for Chuck. Um, great presentation, wonderful initiatives and programs. Um, the, the clean hotel initiative or program, um, how was that? So as far as primary prevention leading to policy um, and, and, and influencing policy, so you were talking about how it influenced um, kind of state or local policy. Um, did you all evaluate the actual hotel's policy on um, on like sexual assault or domestic violence or you know any of their protocols or anything like that so that you not only um, address kind of the violent um, the violent pornography that was in that environment but also kind of the interpersonal um, uh, policy that, that were that were um, presented no no which is a great conversation there's been a lot of training in Minnesota around sex trafficking with hotels and teaching them how to see the red flags of sex trafficking and prostitution going on. 
Um, but there, for this initiative, no, we were very specific, focused on this one piece around uh, divestiture plan and pulling the money out of businesses that would uh, profit from women's pain. Yeah, but it's a good, very good question. So any of these initiatives you can string off, right? It has ripple effects um, that you can build from. And I think that's kind of what I what goes on in my head when you said that is that uh, what's the ripple effect here? Yeah, because I thought of like the hotel workers, like what is their experience and how does that connect to the pornography being shown and all of those different things. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then the last one was with the um, with the uh, the men engaging uh, that last initiative. What was it? The mending. Called? The mending. The mending project. Uh, right, the mending project. So was that specifically focused on um, uh, sexual assault, or was it uh, was it both domestic violence and sexual assault? It was domestic violence and sexual assault, including mm -hmm. sex trafficking and prostitution things. Okay. As, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you work in collaboration with the Advocacy Victim Services Center, closely in, in, in uh, cooperation with them to make it happen. But the men do the work. That's the key here. The men do the work. And, and so with, with that, I just want to know, what was your outreach strategy and uh, plan in order to make that uh, particular program successful? Well, the, our, we had limited capacity for promotion and outreach. And so that continues to happen just in, in, in scenarios like this and others and connection. And so because of the capacity of the resources and stuff had limited, we had to decide where we want to put our resources. So we put it into the model and uh, have been doing what outreach and promotion we can. But I would have loved to have much more uh, resources to do promotion on all these initiatives. But I'm very happy to have them to be able to share them as well. Yeah. So it's a good, very good question. Yeah. Thanks everyone. So we're going to need to move on. But like I said, we'll probably have time at the very end. Uh, so thanks for those questions. Thanks for answering them. Chuck uh, and Russ will definitely have time at the end again. Um, Alan, is now an okay time for you to unmute and jump into things? <laughs>